That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I forgot to check something. Oh, yep, good, 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 good. Anyway, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I am Super 2 and I need to move my keyboard. Uh, hope I gave plenty of warning tonight. Things look like they're going smoothly, which is usually a sign that everything's fucked. I uh, don't have anyone here alive yet, but that's okay. I'm pretty much just going to get started here in a second. A uh, nice professional sound to start off the show with. Good old relaxing Coca-Cola, which I'm totally not being paid to, to support. <sighs> oh good, we got Robert Emmett here. Hi Robert Emmett. We got someone here live, that always makes me feel good. Hope everyone's doing well, though. Hope all, all is well. Uh, it's been a rough week. have not been too happy with the way things are, are shaping up in the world. So, hopefully reading some comics uh, and talking some comics will make it all better for, for a while. Mick Pick is here. I believe you're a newbie, so welcome. Uh, not really a slow week. We got we got a pretty good amount of books, honestly. Uh, you know, it's nothing nothing to scoff at, but none of my my major hitters. Uh, every day I feel like I walk in the comic shop and they give me a stack. I'm like, ah, that's so much. But I don't know. I got out twenty three bucks today. It's pretty good. Let's go ahead and talk about what we'll be talking about uh, as we we give people another minute or two to get here live. Uh, we'll be starting tonight with Batman Beyond, number 21, The Man of Steel, number 5, Lando, Double or Nothing, number 2, The Flash, number 49, Wonder Woman, number 49, Batman, Prelude to the Wedding, Harley Quinn vs. the Joker, number 1, and Magneto, Infamous. This volume one of Cullen Budden's Magneto series. That'll be for trade talk tonight. Mel Sanchez says, Villanos by Alan Itriel? Uh, no, that's not a book I have tonight. Uh, is that, that new this week or something? I could maybe look into picking that up next week. Uh, leave, leave some comments in the live comments. I'll go back and, and check over that. All right, let's just get into it. We'll start off by talking about Batman Beyond, number 21. So I've talked about a lot how Jurgens does, I feel, write a pretty good Batman Beyond comic. Uh, he, he seems to get Terry. Um, he seems to, to understand the how to write the world. He comes up with pretty decent ideas. Uh, but he just kind of like drags them out too long and and really just stretches the story a lot longer than it needs to be at least for batman beyond in rebirth which is weird because this book isn't on double shipping um like i guess that kind of made sense for the, all the rebirth titles that are on double shipping and the writer just needs to stretch out the story a bit longer uh i i definitely heard that complaint uh this one isn't so it's it's weird that's been happening this story, though, it, it's, it doesn't feel that way. We got a little bit of people think Batman's a monster in the last issue, but it was, like, really peripheral, weird stuff, uh, and Terry didn't have the chance to really be that aware of it. Now it's starting to happen to a lot of people including Matt and Bruce. And that's interesting. Uh, Matt, Bruce, Dana, Commissioner, Barbara Gordon, all these all these um, people that know Terry's Batman think of Batman as a monster. It's, it's really, really weird. And, like, there's a scene where Terry's in Dana's apartment and he's just trying to talk to her about their relationship, blah, 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 drama... And then suddenly she's like, no, you're a demon, you're a hideous monster. And we get some absolutely gorgeous artwork here. Uh, let me turn on my light, sorry about that. 
with some absolutely gorgeous artwork here uh depicting like what these people are seeing kind of stuff and that is really really a great image and it's just you know i'm really really invested in this you know fairly unique plot for for batman beyond and he's like flying around trying to figure out what's happening and sees a statue of bruce's batman and people are trying to destroy it in a riot and he tries to save a kid and when he tries to return the kid to their parent uh the guy's like that freak tried to kill tried to take my child shoot him out of the sky and you know a bunch of jokers start start shooting at him and uh, he's trying to protect people, but then the people that he's trying to protect start trying to kill him, and then the cops show up, and he's like, finally, Barbara Gordon's here, and then they try to kill him, so it's just like this huge what-the-hell's-going-on kind of moment, um, and the only thing that it could possibly be are these new Alexa-esque devices, uh, that are kind of in all these future homes, um... It's there with that green text coming out of it, or green uh, word balloon coming out of it. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting uh, the the plot that's been set up, and we don't know who's doing this, who's making people hate Batman. Um, I'm of two minds as far as speculation and theories go. Part of me thinks it's it's Spellbinder. Uh, from the cartoon and, and, you know, the original Batman Beyond Villain Spellbinder. Um, this definitely seems like in his wheelhouse of things that he could do as far as, like, hypnotizing and tricking people. But I know Jurgens has been reintroducing the Batman classic rogues gallery to Batman Beyond, and obviously you can feel about that however you want to, but... He's been doing it well enough that I really don't mind, and it's not like every story has been one of those. He's just kind of been sparsing it in here and there. Um, so, I don't know. I'm of, I'm of multiple minds about it. But it, it could maybe be Scarecrow is, is the other thought I'm having. Uh, it just depends where it's going to go. What's the, what's the tease say? Right at the very end, we get a... Um, Next, the grips of fear, which definitely like leads me on some level to think Scarecrow, but at the same time, you know the the context. I mean, fear is a really broad word, right? So not every not every little situation is going to mean oh, it has to be Scarecrow. It, it just has to be, uh, just because the word fear popped up and and Jurgens has been doing this. Fear is a pretty common word. It's a descriptor, so it could easily be a million other things. Um, but I don't know. It's just, like, kicking kicking the gears around in my head, all that jazz. Um, I will say, on the art, while I do think this is a talented artist, and they do a pretty good job on a lot of the stuff, I don't like what they're doing design-wise to the Beyond costume. I'm not a Batman Beyond purist. I, I don't mind if you tweak and, and play with the design a little bit. These slits... As for the eyes at the angle, and you can see it there on the cover. It works a bit better when they're thicker, but when they get really thin like that in that panel, I don't like it at all. Uh, it just starts to look really weird. Hi, Manos. Welcome to the show. I just, mm, you know, I'm not, not caring for it. Um, but yeah, pretty good, pretty good story. Uh, definitely invested to see what happens next time. Again, with Jurgens and his tendency to try to drag out a thing, I'm hoping that we get, like, a reasonably quick reveal on who's behind all of this by maybe the middle of next issue. I'm worried he's probably going to drag it out till the end of next issue. If we don't get a reveal by the end of next issue, I'm going to be annoyed again. So we'll just, we'll see how it goes. I don't know. Roll those old dice again. Alrighty, let's go ahead and move along to everybody's favorite, uh, The Man of Steel, number five.
the six issue series is almost over um uh, with brian michael bendis's introduction to superman um this issue was interesting and i I'm a little torn on it. Um, overall, I like the plot. It's beginning to feel a little silly because now we have two separate occasions where, spoilers, where Rogelzar could have killed Superman. Um, and, and just didn't. And I guess Bendis tries his best to give some kind of rational explanation to it, but I just don't buy it. And then the art in this issue, uh, the, the main art of the issue, not counting the flashback stuff by Adam Hughes, I don't like. Um, it's really weird. It starts out really strong with a lot of silhouettes and stuff. And I really like that because they're in space and it looks good and I'm a sucker for silhouettes. And then this opening page of Rogelzar looking into the bottle city of Kandor. That's really, really cool stuff. Um, I really do like that. But then as the issue goes on and the, the scenes begin to get more daylight or, or just natural light kind of stuff... The, the art starts to look I don't want to say lazy but it definitely starts to look unfinished to me um look at Supergirl in that it's just so flat like her face just looks unfinished I'm afraid um like, especially, look at the, the coloring on the face and the eyes in this panel. The eyes don't look white, or, or like they're reflecting light so much. They just, they just look like the same tone as their skin, almost. And this isn't easy to see through camera and with my yellowish tinted light on it, but still. Her eyes don't look white there they just look like we drew the shape of the eyes around the skin tone um and it's not like that's that's a coloring technique that's unheard of in comics i just think it looks really really awkward in this situation same with the justice league look how flat the flash looks on screen i mean cyborg's design is super complex and it just clearly does not lend itself to this style uh, Batman's really the only one that works here. Wonder Woman, too many lines, does not look good with this really flat coloring. Uh, Green Lantern is is kind of in the middle there for me. And that's just, really, it's all over the book, and it starts to get really annoying to me as it goes on. Like, this scene in the hospital room, I feel, is just inexcusable. Like, there's just a lack of faces uh, it just looks like that's, I feel like that's the level of detail you'd expect if the characters were much farther away. Like, there's an example of that a couple of pages ago, my bad. Um, like, okay, you look at the, the crew fighting the fire on the ground here, or in the background, uh, on the Justice League image, you can see... Like these guys down here, you know that that's understandable to me, but that it's such a huge panel on the page that feels like such a waste of space and and detail work. Uh, I really really don't like that. Um, there's some other moments, and then. Then when more detail starts to come in, it, it starts to feel really jarring. Like, this level I'm perfectly fine with if it had been consistent, but it's just not, and that's disappointing. Um, so yeah, the art really took me out of it, and I was very, very questioning of the, the plot development here. Because at the beginning of the issue, Rogozar and Superman 
are fighting in space and on the moon. This is post Superman using the solar flare power to, uh, you know, get the drop on Rogalzar. And so this, this whole thing is a fight on the moon, and there's some interesting uh, internal monologue from Superman, and I, I like all that just fine. But then, Rogalzar clearly wins the fight and knocks Superman the fuck out for like the second or third time and then just leaves him there. And we get an explanation later on as the Justice League's questioning Superman, trying to figure out what they can do to help. And Wonder Woman says, he doesn't run away. He retreats. It's warfare tactics. It's battle negotiation without ego. He's a practice creature of war. Is he, though? Like, okay, he wants to kill Superman and wipe out all Kryptonians. Um, fine. Maybe he needs Superman to gain information since he figured out that Superman's got a family. What... What possible reason does he have to just leave him? You know, like, that's the thing that I, I feel is getting me the most, is he's got him. Like, to torture him or, or just fucking kill him, especially given what he's about to do at the end of the issue. Which is... Drill down to the core of the earth and destroy the earth. And the reason for that being, if Krypton had to be cleansed simply because Kryptonians lived on it, then now the Earth has to go. Like, that's that's the explanation. Which, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that for his motivation and thought process of, oh, Kryptonians have been on this planet, I gotta wipe it out. But, like, why does... does if he's, he's worried that Superman has a kid... And he's planning to blow up the Earth anyway. Why would he not just kill Superman when he had the chance? It it feels super contrived to just keep leaving Superman alive. Not once, but twice, when he clearly has the power to do so. And this isn't like the villain captured him and, and put him in a death trap. It's not like that trope. It's like he just beat the shit out of him, knew he was still alive, and left him in the dirt. Mm, don't like it. I just, I don't, I don't. That's, that's some weak sauce to me. I'm sorry. I'm liking a lot of what Bendis is doing here, but that's, that's weak. This is really, really contrived. And I don't... I, I can't... He's gotta explain that. So yeah, so far, I've liked a lot of this series. And I've thought it's been pretty good. Uh, this issue is by far the weakest, both on plot and on art. Uh, Jay Fabak murders it uh, in, in his scene. Uh, that he's been drawing four or five times now. Uh, I really like Jay Fabok's art. It's amazing. Uh, if you didn't know, Jason Fabok is starting his own YouTube channel where he's planning to broadcast uh, himself working on comics and, and talk about uh, the process of drawing comics out. So I believe it's called the Fabocalypse. Uh, here on YouTube, he's only got, you know, an intro video out so far. He doesn't have anything else. Um, so go subscribe to that, because that's going to be cool. I'm excited when he starts uploading uh, videos, talk about some of this stuff. But yeah, uh, this is... The scene I don't like, either? Um... I believe the reason Super Sun's got got its, like, ongoing series 
ended was because Bendis has plans for John Kent, and these are his plans. But um, I don't like his plans. I don't like the way he writes John Kent. I'm just going to read John's dialogue in this scene. Uh, yeah, I mean, he is my grandpa. That depends. Exactly how much underwear do you think I'll be needing, and what happens when I run out? And you'd have me back before school starts. Why not? Well, yeah, it's a super complicated family history. I'm going. He's just... He's a jerk to his parents here. Apparently, Jor-El shows up. It's like, I'm taking John with me to go explore the universe, yada yada. And John's not... John's not John. Um, he's being super rude and defiant to his parents. And, like, not... Not in a a way where I feel like Damien's rubbed off on him or, or he's really just trying to do what he thinks is right in just a jerky kid way, which I could totally buy this if, you know, we're just going, well, he's getting older, he's, he's grown into a rebellious phase, but something about John Kent, it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, I really don't like this. And also, it's still really weird that jor alive, apparently. Uh, I'm really not digging this. This is making me worried for what exactly Bendis has planned with John. Uh, so Bendis ignoring the Oz effect from Action Comic Story arc, which makes sense with John and Jot L because they meet each other there, and John said he'll never join jor adventures. Good to know that this isn't paying attention to continuity either another another list in the problems there I don't know it's really out of character and I'm really bothered by it Superman's written really well in his own comic uh I don't know I do like the way Bendis is, is writing and, and characterizing Superman, but I still I still don't like the way that the the plot's necessarily unfolding. It feels like it's got a lot of contrivances, and I don't like the way the art is handled in this issue, um, which is unfortunate because I was really getting into this series. I do like this page, though. My, my problems with Supergirl's detailing aside... I like the way she's saving children from a fire. Um, I've seen a lot of superhero things do that. I don't think I've ever, ever seen anyone just carry all the kids on a couch. Which honestly makes the most sense. You know? Uh, and I like the the variety of reactions. Like one girl's taking a selfie. One girl's wearing a Superman shirt. And she's cheering. One kid's, uh, a couple kids are clearly afraid. One kid's too young to realize what's going on, and so he's treating it like an opportunity to play. One kid's amazed that he's flying. Really like that. That's that's cool idea. I don't know if that was um, Hughes or Bendis that directed that to be what's going on on the couch in the panel. I don't know if Bendis even told him to use the couch, but I quite like that. That's a that's a neat detail. And again, I've just read a lot of superhero comics, seen a lot of superheroes save people from fires. Never seen anyone use a couch to do it. That's... It just seems so obvious now, doesn't it? Like, if you have super strength and you just pick up a couch, it seems like you're going to easily be doing that to carry more people in one go. Because it doesn't matter how much weight you can lift if you can't, like, you know, your arms are only so big. You can only grab so many people. So, I don't know. That's pretty good.
you know, seeing John written out of character makes me think I should start up an incorrect Super Sons Twitter feed. Thoughts, comments, concerns? I can play with a lot. I can play with Damien's crush on Supergirl. I like that idea. I might have to think about that. If, if no one's done it, <laughs> I might have to. Oh. Alrighty. Excuse me. I'm good. Let's go ahead and go on to Star Wars Lando Double or Nothing number two. Uh, still haven't seen Solo. Beginning to feel bad about that at this point because I'm hearing nothing but good things from people. My wife doesn't even really want to go either. She's kind of in the place I am where it's like, ah, yeah, I guess, but not really all that interested. I don't know. I'll get to it eventually. It'll be one of those movies. So, I don't know how much is like original things that are being characterized to Lando for this story, and how much are things that are like being continued uh, or, or added to from the movie. I have to assume that the Cal Calrissian Chronicles are a thing from the movie. If anyone in the comments has seen Solo, please tell me, live comments, please tell me if, if that's a thing in the movie. Because if that's the case, I might have to go see it, like, tonight. Because that is hilarious. <laughs> that is too fucking funny. Calrissian Chronicles, Chapter 4. Once again, Lando outwitted Imperial forces. With odds against him... Yes. Was there a moment of doubt? Absolutely not. He's fucking narrating his life story just moments after the events happen. He's just chronicling it so that he can, you know, sell it to, to people later on. He can sell his story. My god. That's ridiculously funny. <laughs> um, oh, I can't. I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying that. But anyway, it's pretty typical Star Warsy kind of story. Uh, he gets the Millennium Falcon uh, into this uh, planet that's basically a giant scrap heap by, I don't know, reasonably clever. He, he just kind of like kills all the engines and lets it drift into the atmosphere so that the Imperials think that um, that it's just space junk falling to the planet. Uh, and then he, you know, boosts it and turns on the engines at the last second, yada yada. So that's how he gets in there. They start exploring for a way to get these weapons he's smuggling to the, uh, rebels that are on this planet. Um, and they're separated briefly. Uh, and one of them's captured, then Lando's cornered by some, uh, soldiers whatever and I love I love this action scene where they're all like shooting at each other it's very typical Star Wars but they give it a very Lando kind of feel hey if one of you singe my cape your suffering will be legendary I'll tell you why it was from a being by the name of Naru he had a splendid voice could sing like the sweetest of celestials but his car plane lacked the same aptitude. He didn't take defeat well. So much so, he said. Calrissian, you'll be wearing my hide before you make it out of here alive. Well, let's just say, I'll truly miss his singing. That is so fucking great. Oh, that's too funny. I, I can't deal with how awesome that is. Just tells this story where he shoots everybody and and it's got like such a cool ass idea to it. Um, 
You know, if they keep coming, eventually I'll run out of stories. <laughs> oh, that is so good. Ah. Oh. Man. And then he's like, starts running as they start to outgun him with ships. Don't think they'd appreciate him anyway. Uh, ultimately gets in a ship and does some blasty blasts and it looks like, oh no, our hero has been captured. And also the other person on the team that's captured, someone's uh, gonna hurt them and yada yada yada, everything's going wrong. Lando's been captured, they're captured, everyone's captured. Whatever will we do? And then we got like this guy. Uh, I don't know if this is a character from Solo or not. I don't think so. Uh, I don't know. Fun issue. It's always so weird to see. Like, I, I wasn't expecting... I, I know it's Marvel, but I wasn't expecting a Captain America ad to pop up in my Star Wars comic for some reason. Anyway. Yeah, it's a fun issue. I really like the art here. I think the art is super effective. Really exaggerated, fun facial expressions, which I just love. I love stuff like that. It's got a cool sleek look to it. Again, this is nice because it looks like Donald Glover is Lando without it, you know, looking like the artist is just tracing actual images from the film. Um, so yeah, solid book, solid fun book. Uh, enjoying it very much. <laughs> Go and keep reading that. Let's see here. We got uh, Jake Carlson and Robert Emmett still in chat. Okay, it's a thing. The Cal Calrissian Chronicles are a thing. Uh, Jake Carlson says, Woo, I made it. What did I miss? You missed Batman Beyond and Man of Steel. Uh, there's a discuss here about the Teen Titans Rebirth book. Uh, let's see here. Anyway, not all that much going on. Y'all talk amongst yourselves. It's fine. I always wonder, because now YouTube does a thing where the live comments appear in chronological order along with when they showed up in the video. Uh, and I don't know. It's just, that's interesting. I don't know how that really affects people watching this after the fact. Because I don't watch a ton of live stuff on especially after the fact on YouTube. I don't know, it's weird. Alrighty. Let's continue on. Let us press forward and talk about the Flash number forty nine. This is part three of the Flash War. It's not awful. I don't know if it's even bad. It's just pretty typical. Let's see here if I can figure this out. Um... Okay. The first half of the issue. <laughs> is Barry and Wally running and having the same argument that they had last issue. It's it's seriously just the same argument throughout the entire issue. Um, you know, I want to change reality. I don't want you to change reality. When I did it, it went wrong. Yeah, but when you did it, it was different. No, it's the same shit! Like, that's, that's, that's the whole argument. Uh, the Justice League keeps popping up here and there in this to try to stop them from fighting or racing around the world. Um, ultimately, uh, they, they're they completely ineffectual. Um, 
There's a, a discussion about uh, Wally winning. Yes, uh, confirmed. Wally West is the faster Flash. Wally, please, I can't keep up with you. Ah, uh, something's wrong. Um, so yeah. The Flash, uh, the fastest Flash is Wally West. Confirmed. Um, then they break the Speed Force wall and look up to the sky. Reality is cracked. Uh... And then suddenly the entire Justice League is taken out in a flash, all to realize that um, Hunter Zolomon, a.k.a. Zoom, uh, was behind it all. He manipulated Wally into breaking the Speed Force so that he could unleash the other forces uh, called... The Mage Force and... Or no, the Sage Force and the Strength Force. Alright, and he's also now going to be wearing one of Barry's old costumes. Sure, whatever. Uh, the thing I actually do like is the idea that there are other forces. Sage Force, not so much. Um, strength force, I do quite like the idea of. If there can be a speed force, I like the idea that there's a strength force. Um, that's cool to me. Like, if there were forces of physical capabilities, I find that interesting. I'm not sure what else you would do besides speed and strength. And I guess Sage would be kind of like the Mind Force or something. Maybe if you just called it Mind Force, I would have been more happy with it. Um, but yeah, I do kind of like the idea that there are... You know, if we have the Speed Force and like the Reverse Speed Force, I do kind of like the idea that you can, you can fuck, on, fuck around with other things. Especially since, if I remember correctly, Wally's kids who this whole arc has kind of revolved around. One of them had super strength. And I'm trying to remember, um... Like, what the the other one had. Jake Carlson's here live. He can probably help me out. I only read a little bit of that stuff, so I'm, I'm really trying to uh, remember it. Um... New forces are dumb, and that's why the Speed Force shouldn't be a universal thing. So Jake Carlson is not a fan of of the Sage Force and the Strength Force. Um, what would you call the force that affects drug use? I don't know. Uh, this is why the Speed Force should be biological. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Uh, it doesn't fucking matter. They've firmly established that it's not at this point. That's not Williamson doing anything. That's just what it is it's just a force in the universe um i find like we're gonna talk about stupidity of the speed force i find it fucking ridiculous that like barry created it that's where i start to go okay fuck that noise uh okay jai had super strength and irie had phasing until it was mainlined into irie uh Interesting. Um, phase, so she phased through stuff. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of like not really anything. Um, I don't know. It's just that the strength thing in particular had me thinking. But yeah, I don't know. It's like if you're gonna just already make the speed force like a universal thing, I think the stupid thing is the idea that Barry created it. Uh, that's fucking ridiculous. Because, like, I don't know, I had an idea at one point of, like, you know, writing something Green Lantern and have the Guardians say, we even considered giving the protect our protectors the access to what is known as the Speed Force. But we thought that would be too much power with its ability to change reality. Like, something like that would have been really cool. Um, but then just, ah, uh, the, the, 
the stupidity of Barry Allen created the fucking Speed Force. Like, what the fuck would Jay Garrick then, right? What about any other speedster in the DC Universe? What the fuck are they running on? What about the Universal Race from Grant Morrison's? What, what the shit was that? Oh, it's stupid. The Speed Force is a physical force of the universe. Fine, but like Barry Allen creating it is the dumbest thing to me. Anyway. So yeah, Zoom's here and he's... He's tapped into these other mysterious forces. And so issue 50 of The Flash will be The Flash versus The Flash versus The Flash. Um... Okay. So like I get when Hunter Zolomon was created, we didn't have Eater Barthon anymore, and we wanted to give Jeff Johns wants his sandbox to be a sandbox, uh, and and wants everything to, to make sense, blah 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 and, and he wants he wants his flash to have a reverse flash. Uh But then when we brought Thawne back, having two guys running around in the, the yellow costume is just about as dumb as having Barry and, and Wally run around in the same costume with just the slightest variation of color. So, like, Zoom using the Barry Allen costume is really dumb. And I don't like it. And it seems like this would have been the perfect opportunity to just put him in the costume he has in the show. Like, why wouldn't you... Okay, yeah, Black Flash costume for him. Or, or just literally any other color. Orange. Blue. Green. I don't know. Seems like a bad choice to me. That's that's all I got. So overall, I found about half this issue pretty monotonous. Um, the other half had some ideas that I didn't hate, but apparently I'm alone in that camp. Um, Howard Porter's art's pretty good. Howard Porter definitely knows how to do epic. Like, the speed force breaking and, like, that just being reflected in the sky like that. It's pretty fucking cool. Um. Yeah. Let's see here. What's, what's the live comments like? Uh. In Justice League, Snyder introduced new lanterns based on the invisible light spectrum, so now we have the ultraviolet lanterns who are fueled by negative emotions. Cool idea. Book still sucks. <laughs> uh, Tari says, Terry says, off topic, but there was a cool Mogo shot at the end of Hal and the Green, Jordan and the Green Lantern cards today. Cool, cool. Mana says, so th are there forces for everything? Is there a cupcake force? Yes, there's a cupcake force. Um... Jake Carlson says, I hate Hunter in the Flash costume because that's literally Earbart's Eerba whole thing. He wanted to be the Flash. Hunter wants to make the Flash better. Yeah, that's that's right. Oh, but I am right about the costume thing. Zoom's CW costume ain't bad. Uh, the only thing is if you want to keep, like, Black Flash in there as, like, death. Um, which, if you're willing to just throw that out and make it the Black Racer, like Grant Morrison uh, headcanon in Final Crisis, you're good. Um, you, you can totally def differentiate at that point, because one's got the fucking weird-ass skis, but it works. Uh, Kuma Ranger says, The problem with, is that with all these extended power sets, is a year from now, these new powers will be forgotten and separated all and repeated all over again. Maybe. You're, you're probably right. Um... Uh, I am one with the eating Cocoa Puffs force. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, 
this doesn't really work for me. Again, I don't think it's awful, but I do. I certainly don't think it's good. Uh, it just feels like this ground we keep retreading. Um, I will say, Wally is less of an awful person than Barry. Uh, given the context for why he wants to try to fuck with reality. That being, he is under clearly evident mental distress and he is being manipulated by someone who knows him very well. So, Wally is not in the right state of mind, whereas Barry's just like really sad about his mom being killed. And, and that makes him an awful person for trying to change reality in a way that Wally's not. Wally's clearly not in the right frame of mind in this story. So him trying to do it at least makes some more sense. Uh, yeah. That's all I got. I'm done with this issue. We shall continue on, though. Everyone doing good in the comments? Comments? Soda. Apparently, according to my Coke, I'm a football fan. Remember when they were doing the, the whole name thing on Cokes? Remember that? That was cool. Uh, I really did keep that because someone gave me that as a gift. They, they went to a store and, and bought me a Coke with my name on it. I like, had to imagine they had to look for a while. Um, but, like, I like that a lot more than falsely advertising that I'm a football fan. Because I'm not. I'm all about that American football with the ball that you throw with your hands and catch with your hands and run with in your hands. To be fair, I guess it is the only American sport where you do actually kick the ball. Baseball. <laughs> Basketball. Tennis. <laughs> like. Just throwing those out there. Alright. Let's go ahead and move along to Wonder Woman number 49. It doesn't suck. Uh, it's like a thing that exists. Uh, Wonder Woman and Jason Woman are trying to fight the Dark Gods and they keep fighting the Dark Gods. Uh, we're now all over the world, um, and just like, I don't know, Wonder Woman and Jason throw the leader of the Dark Gods in the ocean and then try to go deal with them on their own for a bit, but it doesn't work out, and then the Dark Gods reunite and have brainwash Jason to join them and follow them and attack his sister and yeah that's that's where the issue ends and it's to be concluded um that's all fine I really don't care I hope Wonder Woman snaps Jason's neck like a dry twig uh but let's talk about paneling let's talk about narration let's talk about structuring of a story in a comic book um so i'm gonna go through this book you know basically page by page and explain why it doesn't work uh all right so we start off with narration from jason we get three boxes 
where he says he's worried about what's going to happen, but he's got his sister by his side, and she's super confident, so that's going to work out all fine. First problem here is the narration boxes are next to Wonder Woman's head at the beginning, more so than they are Jason's head. So you immediately see this, and since there's no logo or anything on the box, you have to figure out on your own that it's Jason's dialogue, which, I mean, to be fair, it, you figure that out within the first sentence. Now I have my sister by my side again. Okay, okay, it's fine. It's fine. Then Wonder Woman's narration boxes are down here. And Wonder Woman's narration boxes go, The dark gods are everywhere wreaking, wreaking havoc. My teammate in the Justice League have been consumed by King Best, the gods leader. I put on my an expression of resolve for my brother's sake, but truthfully... And then we get... It's, it's a trailing truthfully... And then we get The Dark Gods, Part 4, written by James Robinson. But truthfully, how can this possibly end well? If you're going to have a trailing uh, narration like that right above your title, structurally your title should be able to finish the thought. And it doesn't. It's not like, it's not even like, I keep damaging the damn book every time, but that's okay because it's not very good. It's not like the, the title's even thought of here. The story arc's just called The Dark Gods. That's going to be the, the title of the trade, The Dark Gods. The sub-chapter name here is Part 4. There's no thought into into the chapter of this and again it's this is what you call minimal effort wherein there's no thought or very little thought put into the placement of narration balloons in relation to the characters or the layout of the page there's no thought put into titling the chapter or putting the narration balloons above the title. And I'm not going to blame Robinson for that. He probably didn't tell the, the letterer or whoever to do that. Still a bad decision. Still, this, this whole arc, this whole book since Robinson has come on, has felt like people are here to cash a paycheck. The only people putting in genuine effort on Robinson's run that, that feels like it's really, really trying to pay off some great stuff is the art. Because this looks fucking great. Fake-ass dark side all you want, but it looks great. And it's disappointing because the, the writing does not deserve this level of art. So anyway, two-page spread. Uh, Jason and, and Wonder Woman looking at king best uh trying to figure out what to do and then two page spread of steve trevor breaking down where all the dark gods are and then wonder woman and jason start fighting king best cut to four panels where we introduce four characters in different parts of the world they're all Starting their day. Keep in mind the Dark Gods are now located in different parts of the world. This introduces them and, and what they're all up to and what kind of person they are. Cut back to Jason and Wonder Woman fighting King Best. Ad page. Flip. Cut back to four panels of these people experiencing the beginnings of the effects on the Dark go of the Dark Gods. Add page. Flip page. Cut back to Jason and Wonder Woman fighting King Best. Add page. Flip page. Cut back to four panels of the people falling further into the effects of King's Best. Add page. Flip page. Cut back to Wonder Woman and Jason fighting King Best in a two-page spread. Flip page. <laughs> Double add page. Flip page. Wonder Woman flying to meet Steve Trevor. Add page. Flip page. 
Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor talking. Ad page. Flip page. Jason going to fight the uh, Dark God of War. Ad page. Flip page. Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor talking. Two pages. Wonder Woman goes off to fight the Dark Gods who have reunited. Ad flip page. Wonder Woman attacked by Jason. Ad page. Flip page. Jason now has joined the Dark Gods. That is so all over the goddamn place. Uh, this... It's just like a mess. To keep cutting back and forth between that many scenes. This ain't a fucking Nolan movie, bro. Alright, so let's hear one. Two. Three. Three pages of story that show the effects the Dark Gods are having to the man on the street. And that is what we get. Uh, why wasn't that the prologue? What possible reason was that not the prologue? Or was that not its own independent three consecutive pages after... Oh, this should have been Wonder Woman and Jason start to fight King Best. Flip page. You start here, not here, here. And do these three pages of people in the world feeling the effects. And you do one little caption uh, elsewhere in the world and start with Bre Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, London, England. Wuhan, China, and then you just do three pages of these people feeling the effects of the Dark Gods now that you know where they are in the world. That's sensible. That's how you tell story and craft it and ground it so that when you see Wonder Woman fighting King Best alongside her brother, you understand what's at stake as opposed to Steve Trevor just vaguely saying, Oh yeah, the savage fire gods in South America and the mob gods in Britain and Carnell's in China and the last god, the god without without a name is in St. Petersburg, Russia. Like <sighs> That's just minimal effort and thought put into the structure of the book. And again, it's a real fucking disappointment. Because the art is absolutely incredible. Uh, so yeah, just very disappointed in this. Uh, let's see here. Emmanuel Cabeza says, Robinson is confirmed to leave the book, so on at issue 50. Uh, and Steve Orlando is taking over once Robinson's done. I'm not a huge Steve Orlando fan. I think he's fine. Uh... I think he does a decent job. Uh, like, I liked, uh, what was it, Night of the Monster Men. I didn't think it was, like, blow my socks off amazing or anything, but I liked it. Hopefully he's got some kind of voice for Wonder Woman and doesn't make a book about Jason Woman. Um, you know... I just have a lot of trouble when we give one of DC's flagship characters over to people who clearly just don't have any idea what to do with her. Don't understand the character. Um, I'll put this out there right now. Margaret Bennett, Joel Jones, Wonder Woman run. Done. It'll be the best run she's had in decades. Uh, and that's the thing. Like, I, I open this saying that this isn't bad. It is just a thing that exists. But Wonder Woman deserves more. And that's so frustrating. Uh... Kelly Sue DeConnick's um, 
Wonder Woman Black Label's coming up soon. And that I'm very expi- excited for. Uh, excited for. I'm excited out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> uh speaking of joel jones are you getting catwoman i'll probably pick up the first issue uh I'll, like i love joel jones art and i'm really curious to see how she does it writing because i don't think i've ever written or read anything that she's written um but in all honesty i'm kind of into it for uh what's her name laura allred's uh coloring that Laura, I love Mike Allred. He, Mike Allred gets straight to my heart. And funny thing about Mike Allred as an artist is he's colorblind, so his wife Laura Allred does the the coloring for his books, um, and she does a really great style that that perfectly blends in with what he does. Um, and I've seen a lot of Joel Jones' stuff now, and I think that that uh, Laura Allred's style of of coloring is gonna work really really well with um with what uh joel jones brings to the table so that i'm excited for so i'll definitely be picking up the first issue if nothing else as far as adding it to my poll i don't know luckily some things are going out uh at the same time there's a couple things i kind of want to get probably despite my better judgment uh anyway yep Okay, give me one sec. I'll be right back. I just need to turn on another light because it's getting dark. Summer's weird. La, 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 la. You know, it's funny. Uh, Akuma Ranger's like talking about the, the cover of this book, and I don't want to talk about this book for much longer. Um points for cover that has nothing to do with what happens in the book <laughs> like like uh savage fire is is in this issue yes and wonder woman is fighting the dark gods in this issue yes wonder woman does not fight savage fire jason fights savage fire <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this shit. I do like the design for Savage Fire. Again, the artists are killing on on this book that's just being really poorly written. Uh, it's like a female ghost writer blended with like a Chinese demon. It's cool as shit. Uh, kind of digging that. Otherwise, I don't know. Not not much nice I can say about this book. Uh, cool stuff. Anyway, let's swig of my coke and we'll go on to the last book of the week. Harley Quinn, or sorry, Batman, Prelude to the Wedding, Harley Quinn vs. the Joker, number one. Everyone needs to go pick this up because it's one of the rare examples where Harley Quinn is written well in a comic book. R.I.P. headphones, but I couldn't resist. Um. <laughs> oh, I get I get to have too much fun on this show. Um, so yeah, the the premise of this issue, everyone's versing each other. Uh, the premise of this issue is Harley Quinn is getting vengeance on the Joker and throwing him into a bunch of death traps uh, because she doesn't want the Joker. To ruin Batman and Catwoman's wedding. Uh, this gets points for writing Harley Quinn well. And it gets in a comic book because she is so rarely w- written well in to my to my standards. Uh, I think there's a very different crowd of people out there for Harley Quinn books sometimes. but It gets points from me for writing Harley well. It gets bonus points from me... For writing Harley well and having her not be in love with the Joker while it's doing it. Or at least not blatantly kind uh, to the Joker. Um, There's kind of a subtext that maybe she's, or that she probably still has feelings for her, for him. Uh, 
but yeah. So let's see. This was a, a what five issue series because we had Batman versus or we had a uh, Damian versus Ra's al Ghul, Nightwing versus Hush, Batgirl versus the Riddler, Jason Todd versus Anarchy, and Harley versus Joker. Uh, Damian was great. Riddler and Batgirl was great. This is great. Jason and Anarchy was okay. That's that's like a little half a point. There was only one issue that really didn't land for me in this whole series. So ultim ultimately, this is a good series. Uh, it's it's just it's a shameless weekly tie-in that's just trying to get your money. But Tim Seeley does a lot of strong character work and dynamics for this in a big way. Uh, that's that's good stuff. So anyway, yeah, Harley Quinn keeps kidnapping the Joker. Like, I love, I love her first trap. I don't know how the hell she did it, but I love it. There are these kids hanging out in a rough part of Gotham, and they find, like, a vat or some shit, like a silo. And suddenly the door busts open, and the Joker falls out, and he's covered... And the, the pile that he's he's in is all teeth. Uh, it's just a giant silo filled with teeth. Like, ah, here you go, teeth. Um, I'm out. All it took was a lot of brushing right through the rust and the grime to the release button. Sigh. So I get it. Teeth. A toothbrush, gotta get that clean, healthy smile, like four out of five dentists recommend. As hilariously themed Death Trap goes, it barely rates a heh. But I'm out now, out on the streets of my beloved beviled Gotham. I'm going to find someone, some innocent, oblivious Gothamite going about his day, hopefully on a unicycle or with a t-shirt that says I'm with stupid, and I'm going to bleed him out. You'll get to listen to the burbling screams and know this is all your... Boom! Gets hit like a car. Or by a car. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's, he gets out of a death trap. And, and... Boop, 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 boop. Calls up Harley Quinn and starts criticizing her death trap for him. Uh, then she shows up, whacks him with a car and a mallet. And then he wakes up in a giant vat that is slowly filling with tapioca pudding, which of course he hates. Uh, I love that they keep having Harley switch outfits in this book. That's adorable. Uh, so she's got this like pastry chef thing going for her. Um, that's that's really good. And they start arguing, and she's like, "I got your information from the Riddler." And he goes, "Well." He won't after this. I'm going to pluck out Enigma's eyes and put cheese balls in the holes. Ha! Cheese balls. Salty and delicious. Just like eyes. <laughs> Seely writes the Joker pretty damn well. Um, that's pretty good. And I love that he's just, he's just like super fucking critical of Harley Quinn's death traps. Anyway, obvious facts aside... This here is a weak death trap concept, Harls. Playing out your signature line is far too precious. Plus, there's just nothing inherently scary about dessert. I mean, look at it. No fangs or fire or chainsaws at all. Now, let's cut to the chase. It, like, just, he's, he's just like so passive in these conversations and, and dealing with Harley Quinn as she tries to fucking murder him. And she's like, no, I get you. You, you un I understand you more than you know, and I'm not going to let you ruin Batman and Catwoman's wedding. And I like that aspect of it because Catwoman and Harley have, like, kind of a casual friendship thing going on. So it's kind of working. Um, uh, so anyways, she knows that Joker's going to get out of the death trap. Uh, and I, I do like the sequence of how, how it happens. He just kind of bursts through the side and starts... Spilling tapioca, uh, pudding everywhere. <laughs> um, and yeah, and Harley Quinn shows up and kicks the shit out of him. Uh, 
I kind of dig it. You know, it's it's a neat little reversal on what you're used to seeing with Joker and Harley. And so that's nice. Um, and I like the way she's talking. It's about cognitive empathy. It's about finally understanding w w what it was like to be me in our relationship. By, ex by experiencing what it's like to be trapped. You need to know what it's like to feel hopeless and afraid. Sure, you'll never be free. I want you to know that el elation of finally having the strength to get out and enjoy the pride of discovering the means. And then I want you to know the despair of being beaten down and captured. Of being trapped all over again. Cracks him in the face. So this is doing a lot of things that I really, really like. And it's doing it in a way that I do not expect. So my ultimate thing with Harley Quinn that I've always said since I've read or seen Harley Quinn in absolutely anything is she does not work without the Joker. She was a character created to be in relation to the... She is a character linked to the Joker in every conceivable way. And if you are writing Harley Quinn and the Joker is not part of her story in a meaningful way, you are not writing a good Harley Quinn story. Which is probably why she cannot work for an ongoing series, in my opinion. I've read three or four good Harley Quinn stories. And they are usually one-shots like this, or they are, are related in some way to, to something else. I don't think she can work for ongoings. I'd have no problem with, with some Harley Quinn miniseries. Tim Seeley has proven to me that he knows how to write Harley Quinn and the Joker. Let Tim Seeley do a Harley Quinn miniseries. He knows what he's doing with this character. So there's that. It's smart in that it is, is writing Harley in relation to the Joker. Second thing. It is addressing the nature of an abusive relationship. And that's great. Because they have an abusive relationship. I don't like when things try to romanticize the relationship between Harley and Joker. Um, White Knight's kind of an odd thing. That's a bit of an exception. We'll just ignore it. Um, so it's, it's addressing the abusive relationship. It is flipping the abuse. It is, it, or not flipping, it is confronting the abuse. That's really important. This is the empowered Harley Quinn story that you kind of need. Um, this has a lot going for it. And then, I don't know, this, this just really is working for me. And then it really helps that the art's having a lot of fun and doing a lot of cool stuff. Again, Harley in this pastry girl outfit, it's super cute, it's super fun. I totally buy that something she'd wear. Uh, and then we get a flip. Here's a well done use of a page transition since I was talking about this in Wonder Woman. She punches Joker's lights out. Black panel with sound effect, add page, you're excited, you want to flip the next page, black panel, transition to our next scene, Joker's tied up, and a bunch of projected film characters, cartoon characters, are talking to him. Uh, good morning, Mr. Joker, sir. We're glad, we're so glad you're here. Golly, yeah, happier than me and shit. That's adorable. The pig says happier than me and shit. Uh. We hope you like it here. We hope. We hope. We hope you like it here. Oh, for the love of... I sure used to love these cartoons as a little girl. Didn't everybody? Tell the crowd pleases. We think you'll find it's good. We think you'll find it's full of laughs and good cheer. I always wanted to be a princess with a pretty sparkling dress. Harley Quinn in a princess outfit. Bam. 
Harley Quinn got a princess dress. That's more adorable. That's even better. They're having so much fun with this issue. I'm loving it. Oh, they're doing a great job here. And I wanted a fairy tale romance with a handsome prince who'd love me happily ever after. If we say so ourselves, we're really quite good hosts. But don't you know, all the old fairy tales, they based on those cartoons, aren't so cute and sanitized. Do a dance, raise a glass, let's make some toasts. If you aren't happy, we'll make sure, we'll make it better, we sure will try. They're like life, real life. They're cruel, brutal, and honest, filled with horror and pain. We hope, we hope, we hope you like it here. And sooner or later, someone always gets beheaded by a woodsman. Thum, thum, thum. Joker's tied down, turns around. Add page placement. Look at that. Look at that structure. Oh my god, this is just so well done. And it's so simple to do these things well. You ha you set there's the setup. Oh no. There's the, the lead up. Thum thum thum. And then oh no, an ad page, so I can't glance and see it coming. And you flip the page. Cause this place, my friend. Is where you're going to die! Huntsman with an axe! Oh, it's great, it's great, it's great. Carls, please, you don't have to do this. Sorry, Mr. J. I can't let you ruin that wedding. It's a real fairy tale. The closest thing we're ever going to get to it on, anyway. The knight and the thief, the high flying bat, and the street running cat. I'm not letting you go this time. And I made sure there's no escaping anymore. This is the final death trap, Puddin. I hope death feels like a kiss. Harley, you can't do this to me. I'm the Joker. I... I, ah... Uh, crap. You want to know the truth? The fact is, I've always needed you, Harls. More than I care to admit. You inspire me. Harley Quinn... You're my death trap muse. What? Whoosh, turns around. Hold up, truck. Okies. What are you saying you've always hated my death traps? None of them were good enough for you. Not the death of a hundred smiles, the, coll the collegeville caper, or the beaver dam of the damned. All you ever did was complain about them. I was jealous. Threatened. Your ideas have always been inspired in high concept, outside the box, yet familiar. You brought that bright-eyed enthusiasm into my life just as I was getting jaded and bored. I wanted to get back at Batman and his weasel wench harls. I wanted them trapped and screaming and thinking, Wow, this is a death trap. I am just thrilled to be sawed into here. But I've been so angry and offended that my inspiration dried up and died out. I needed stimulation. That's why I let you capture me. <laughs> okay, right, you let me catch you. Sure, Joker. Nice try. I'm not gonna play your mind games, former professional psychiatrist here, remember? Truck, kill him. Ahem, <clears throat> truck. Your concept for this particular piece, let's call it the fairy tale ending, is deep, immersive, complicated, and therein lies the problem. You're so focused on the technical details, making sure the annihilate the animation lined up with choreography that the song hit all the right notes, that you forgot to take the step back and look at the bigger picture, at the human factors. You were quick to assume our old abandoned henchmen would side with you unequivocally. You're both victims, after all. He. But the truth, Harls, is that some people prefer it when I make choices for them. They like giving themselves over to me. Isn't that right, Truck? <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. This goes so fucking sideways, so fucking quickly, and it's so fucking perfect. Tim Seeley has sold me that he could write 
a great Harley Quinn miniseries with, here's a novel idea, the Joker as the fucking villain! <laughs> like, that's just, it's really well done. Jay Carlson says, I thought this was just okay. True, Harley is written well, but I thought Joker was just typical. I'm not, like, super amazed by his Joker here, but his Joker's written well, his Joker's written smart, it's written in character, which is saying something in a post-Scott Snyder world. Um, it's a really, really tightly written Joker, if nothing else, and it's playing so well against a fantastically written Harley Quinn. That's why it's working so well for me. But anyway, yeah. So Joker, of course, has a hold on people. And so when Harley goes to a former henchman that they both know, she didn't think that maybe, just maybe, he'd be more loyal to the Joker than he would be to her. Um, Jake's saying that he'll give this another read. Uh, it takes a lot to impress you with Joker. It shouldn't take much to impress you with Harley Quinn because so much of what's out there for her is just bad. Um... This is, again, one of the few well-written Harley Quinn comics, and that's special. So anyways, um, Joker gets the axe and kind of takes over the whole situation like he had planned all along, apparently, through Chuck. Um, and so he starts attacking Harley, and she's completely bamboozled she's not uh much for improv it seems and so all this tight planning's gone by the wayside and she doesn't really know what to do and the joker's kind of a mad devil and so he attacks her but he knocks her out and i like this line look at that instead of giving you a grin on the back of your head i turn the axe at the very last second i guess i don't really want you dead Somewhere deep inside of me, I know that someday you'll realize I'm the only thing that makes you happy. Someday you'll desperately want to come back. And on that day, you'll know what it's like to be left alone and left out, waiting for an invitation. I hope, I hope, I hope you like it here. Ah, uh, That's great. The idea that the Joker loves Harley Quinn has always bothered me. The Joker couldn't give a damn is the, the phrasing I used to use, and to an extent I still believe that, but that might muddy what I'm trying to say. If Harley died, the Joker would not be broken up about it. He may be slightly disappointed. Um, the Joker is not invested in Harley Quinn for... A love and affection uh, in the way in the way that uh, you would you would be invested in your partner like myself my wife the Joker loves Harley and Seeley does a really good job of showing it here because she's useful for him she's one of the few things that he can actually rely on and that's when he was when she was his doctor in Arkham she let him out. When he was her, his henchwoman, she was his best best uh, person to go to. And now that they're separated or whatever, she's still useful to him because she gives him inspiration on death traps. Um, that's really good. I like it. I just really like it. So the idea that he's going to leave her alive uh, because he knows one day she'll come back to him and then he can reject her again and treat her like crap. That's really good twisted, demented stuff for their relationship. I really like that. Both characters I feel are written... Harley Quinn is written fantastically here. I feel the Joker is written pretty well. Uh, nice, manipulative. I love the just constant criti criticisms of her death traps. Uh, again, the art's fantastic. Harley Quinn in a pastry outfit uh, dress, a uh, pastry chef dress, 
and or outfit and a, a princess dress is absolutely fantastic. I love those ideas. And I love the the way the fairy tale ending kind of commentary here works. Um, I also love how this this leads into uh, the the best man story arc that just uh, that that's yeah should have just concluded in the Batman book, uh, where Joker gets out of the death trap and figures out okay, what am I gonna do about this wedding? What kind of death trap am I gonna set up for him? Well, I just gave Harley a whole lecture about how it shouldn't be too complicated. Here's a gun, and there's a church. I'll keep it simple. Uh, and that's, it's great, because it's exactly what worked about the uh, death trap situation in The Best Man. I really like this series. Really, really dug it. This was a lot of fun. Uh, they, they did some great writing in here. So, yeah. Good stuff. Woo! <sighs> Celia solidified himself as a great, albeit safe, writer for pretty much every Bat family member. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Even though I didn't quite like the, um, Nightwing issue, uh, it... That was more because of Hush. Uh, I felt I thought Dick Grayson and Batman's relationship was written well. The scary thing about Joker is that he actually loves Harley. Yeah, to an extent in his own twisted way, sure, but not in the way that you might typically think. Uh, well, of course, Manos, he also cared about a monkey once. Uh -huh. Also depends on how you see the Joker. If the Joker truly super sane and he's reinventing himself, maybe some version of him truly loves her. Again, I don't think so. Not in the way that we classify it. Maybe in his sick little demented way, but not in the way we talk about love. Um, again, I'll, I've said this a million times, only person I see the Joker actively loving is Batman. Well, that's going to do it for the single issues. Go ahead and go on to Trade Talk. <clears throat> oh, uh, I saw Robert Emmett, if he's still here. He was asking, before I started, um, he was asking if I would talk about how, whether or not I'd recommend this without spoilers, and that's a yes. So, I'm going to get into the review itself, then. Bye, folks. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. This week I'm going over Magneto, Volume 1, Infamous. This is the first volume of Cullen Bunn's uh, Magneto series. Yeah, it was a full series with four volumes, might as well call it. Um, that was going on in 2014-2015. And it's really good. It's a really strong take on Magneto. Um... Does some nice violent ass shit with Magneto and also is smart to, you know, play with the idea of how depowered he is currently in continuity, at this point at least. Uh, and do some effective commentary and stuff with that. With that. Um, so the basic premise of this book is that Magneto is going around the country or the world and seeking out um people who have committed crimes against mutants and brutally murdering them and boy is that appealing that's just ah uh, it's not a take over the world scheme it's not like some huge you know, plot with with the X Men all involved. It's just Magneto going around doing some good old fashioned brutal murder of Homo sapiens. Um, and that's ah, uh, that's enjoyable. Uh, like so, page one of this, we get this uh, 
the store clerk talking about what happened to this guy that was sitting in the cafe and says and then he pulled out all the fillings of the doc's mouth with a snap of his fingers the screams nobody should ever hear screams like that that wasn't the worst of it though because after he threw the doc into the street he replaced the fillings Oh, fucking Christ. Wow, what a way to open a book. So it's... It's... So violent. <laughs> it is insanely violent. Uh, and that's really appealing. But yeah. Magneto is just kind of... Going around. It's a little bit of the spy thrillery because he's trying to stay under the radar... Uh, and, and keep himself off of, or off of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s, um, notice, or, or avoid S.H.I.E.L.D.'s detection. He's got a team devoted to him. Uh, and he's just going around trying to, you know, punish the shit out of people. Here's about a guy who killed four mutants, turned himself in, so he goes to the jail, grabs, like, surprises a bunch of police officers... Uh, if he doesn't kill, he hurts the shit out of everybody in the jail, goes to, uh, kill the guy in the prison, uh, turns out the guy's actually a sentinel, and then Magneto gets on a trail of some humans that have had sentinel parts put into them against their will and so that's what the rest of the book's about is Magneto just going around trying to find the source of this um and get a neat, neat flashback to when he was a boy uh and they were trying to steal some bread uh, and get back into the Jewish ghetto um and then that didn't work out for them uh, because they got, or one of their friends got caught by the Gestapo, and a officer said, All right, tell us who you were stealing with, and we'll let you go home with what's left of the food you got, and we'll just get them. And so the kid says one of his friend's names, and then is shot in the head anyway. And Magneto is capturing some of these guys who've been kidnapping the homeless and turning them into sentinels, leaves one alive, and uh, talks to him. He's like, the people you recruit, where do you take them? Tell me and you'll walk out of here. Lessons about desperation and ruthlessness. He tells me everything he knows. He answers my every question. Tells me exactly where to find those responsible. He wants to believe I'll spare him. Perhaps part of me wants to believe it too. But bad times teach you lessons. And they eat you alive. Just as hopelessness can crush your spirit. And turn you into a monster. Blam. Shoots the guy anyway. So that's the really interesting thing about Magneto. Is... He didn't come out of the Holocaust thinking that, like, this can never happen again and we must unite uh, people all over the world so that nothing like this can ever happen again. Came out of the Holocaust and said, this is going to happen again. And I'm going to use the tactics of my enemies to try to make sure it doesn't. And that's fucking cold as shit. And sympathetic isn't the right word. But you can see where he's coming from. I like to think about 
the kinds of experiences that people have and how those experiences shape their worldview. Because I feel we've all gone through the process of hearing some kind of st statistic or something that takes something you believe and scientifically proves that while that may be a problem, it is not a significant issue, and what you're doing in reaction to it will not solve the problem. I think everyone's had something like that. And they've prob and, and I feel like part of the challenge is to address that incongruity between your experiences and the way things are in the world not saying that your experience is not valid, but to comprehend that your experience is not universal. Your experience is not the way it should be. I like to think about how people go through that and thus have to contend with doing with, with that. And how some people can't, how some people can only take their experience and instead of acknowledge its uniqueness, take it as universal and enforce it as universal, if that makes sense. I like that Magneto's a character who, on some level, wants Charles Xavier's view of the world, of the pacifist, neoliberal view of the world, to function and work. He honestly wants it. But he is so trapped in the harshness of reality that he experienced that he honestly cannot believe it will ever work and so is willing to do anything by any means necessary to try to fight for a world that is more beneficial to him and his kind. And I really, really find that interesting, and I think this book plays with that a lot. Uh, so that's about, like, maybe a third of the way into the book. And then the rest of it's basically just him breaking into this facility where they're building sentinels and putting them inside people's bodies. Um, and... He's going to destroy this facility, but like he, he talks about since he's lost some of the scale of his powers, in the past he would have just lifted it all up and thrown it into space, but now he can't do that yet, so he has to infiltrate it um, more secretly and, and stuff, and that's kind of interesting. Um, and I kind of like the, the way that things go for him. Uh, after he's he's gotten into this, where he's kidnapped, uh, or, I don't know, taken one of the scientists in charge of the facility and the, the Sentinel uh, programming. And he's having her blow up the thing, and she's like, she explains that they're not building Sentinels because they want to wipe out the mutants, she kind of comprehends that the mutants, or, or she's of the belief, and, and the people in this facility are of the belief, that mutants will be the dominant species on the planet. And so instead of trying to wipe them out, they just want to be able to reserve some place for themselves, for normal humans, and have sentinels there as security that's really interesting we knew we could create guardians to defend us if mutants tried to ruin what we built but the sentinels are meant only for our protection we don't want to attack mutants 
Places such as this have procedures, protocols to enact should anything go terribly wrong. Things have gone terribly wrong, Doctor. So get to work. This is a refuge for humans. A place where we can live in peace. Where we couldn't harm mutants and they couldn't harm us. Is that so terrible? And as she says that, Magneto goes straight to thinking about Genosha and how it was destroyed, because that's exactly what he was trying to do. I... I won't do this. What... we... we've made mistakes. I recognize that. But you can't force me to demolish everything. You don't understand how much I... and he just... brutally murders her by moving a paperclip through her veins straight into her fucking brain. Ah. I've heard enough, Doctor. Enough. He just blows the place up. Walks the fuck out. Once I could have reduced this structure to rubble with a wave of my hand and a bit of concentration. Now it took a few strokes of a keyboard. <sighs> so yeah. That's the majority of the book. That's probably the first half. The next half sees him um, bumming around a small town trying to figure out what he's going to do next. And, uh, you know, he's kind of like going around saving some uh, mutant kids who were uh, being sent to be cured or whatever. Uh, he goes and, you know, just floating around doing a lot of like small little side missions like that. Uh, takes out some of them. Um, the priests, or whatever they call themselves. Uh, there's another bit where he uh, remembers an attack on mutants that happened um, by a group of clone mutants. Um, and so he's then gets put on a mission to or turned on to a mission to deal with them and try to take them over from Mr. Sinister, who uses them. Uh, and that's all well and interesting, and it's it's definitely got some stuff to it, but by far the most interesting stuff is that first half. Uh, it does definitely make me want to read more. I was looking online trying to find other volumes, and if I can get the the other three volumes of this cheaply, I definitely will and and continue talking about it, because this is pretty good fucking love this cover that's fantastic um so anyways he uh instead of like just killing these clones because what what these mutants do is is they're cloned they're sent out on missions and then they when they die on those missions they're reborn uh so instead of just killing them magneto uh kills them and takes control of the bio software, blah, 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 jargon science that uh, creates the new ones so that the new ones will be subservient to him. Okay, this cover. There are a lot of gag covers in this series. Cover gallery, please, for the love of God, this is ruining the mood. <laughs> like, there's that one. There's another one where it's... Um, a mouse of all things and like it's cute it's fun I laughed but I'm so not in the mood to laugh reading this fucking brutal ass book uh, Deadpool cover too like I don't mind doing stuff like that and I like that they're including the variants in the trade just not in the that way please if you can put the variants please put them in the back where they're not distracting from the tone of the story uh, like, they do it for a bunch of the variants, but not all of them, and I don't know why. <sighs> Whatever. Yeah, really good series. Definitely planning to pick up more of it if I can find it. Um, I, I hate buying comics online. Uh, I got this at a half price books, and it's in really good condition, which is rare. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to see if I can find more copies, or more volumes of, of this run. Uh, Cullen Budden has not been a writer I've been a fan of. I read his Sinestro and a bit of his Venom um, with with Flash Thompson. And he never really did it for me. This the first time Cullen Budden's really hit something out of the park for me, so that's exciting. He knows how to write Magneto. All right, everyone. 
I think that'll do it for this episode of Trade Talk. Thanks very much for watching. Till next time, bye.